if there's a word that seems most connected to what we focus on today, I think that word is Hosanna, that unique word of praise that's not from the common Greek that the New Testament was written in, but it's actually from the Aramaic that they spoke on a daily basis. The word is found in every gospel account of what we call the Palm Sunday narrative, except for Luke's gospel. Luke actually wrote about the celebration by Jesus' disciples that took place on the outside of the city rather than on what took place within the walls of Jerusalem, what we find actually in the other gospels. Hosanna is only used by the gospel writers in relating this one event. And the word is an exclamation of praise, but it literally means save or help, I pray. It's kind of odd that it, 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 to us it doesn't seem like one word can be both praise and plea, but that's Hosanna. It seems like to me there's a humility to that word, though. Even in our praise, we proclaim our dependence upon the grace of God. From the people of God who were living under foreign occupation, there seems to be kind of a faith lesson in it all. We fiercely trust in our God and his grace so much that even when we are defeated, overrun, and undermined, we praise God. But even in our praise, we are asking, we are hoping, we're believing that God is going to turn our situation around. That's Hosanna. Our cry for help is our expression of praise. It's still hard to get our heads around, but it captures the unique wonder of our God and Savior. Today in the service, we're going to be seeing, Allie has been working with our children to make palm leaves into crosses, and we'll be seeing that today in the church. And it's kind of great that we were able to make them ourselves this year rather than just ordering them pre-made like we've done sometimes in the past. I think those little Palm Sunday crosses go well with our Hosanna. And the fact, too, that this day, it's kind of the day where we try to bridge both Palm Sunday and then work into Passion Sunday. So our worship begins with praise, and then it moves toward an emphasis on the saving of God. It, it really is a Hosanna kind of day. And Christians have long hung to the word because we see the cross of Good Friday as bringing about the saving that was cried out for in the expression of praise that was given at Jesus' triumphal entry. Now, Friday in our Tenebrae service, we'll be hearing the words of Luke's gospel. But today, I want us to look at just a part of Matthew's account. And I'm kind of skipping over the trial narrative that was a big part of today's reading to focus on the part of the passage that moves directly toward the crucifixion. So it's Matthew 27, beginning with verse 28 and reading through verse 54. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And Matthew tells it like this. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him. And took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe in him. 
He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Ali, Ali, laba sabachthani. And that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, this man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. You know, Matthew, as we read through that narrative, he doesn't go into a lot of details about the crucifixion itself. He he almost skips over that part. He gets right up to the event and then suddenly says, and when they had crucified him, they divided his clothing. Television and movies bring so much reality to this moment, and yet Matthew feels no need to go into the details. And perhaps, honestly, he just assumed his audience knew all too well what was involved the nature of the suffering, and the struggle for each breath that took place until the end. We get so much more detail concerning the mockery from those around and beneath him. Matthew also gives much more detail about the cosmic significance of what's happening here. The darkness over the land, tombs open, dead were raised. And Matthew, who wrote that when Jesus entered the city, Jerusalem was shaken or quaked. Now we're told the earthquake is literal upon Jesus' death. So often, though, the focus is on the words we translate as, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, people wrestle with those words, and some have even historically been led to believe that somehow God the Father abandoned Jesus the Son while he was on the cross. And that's pretty questionable theology, and it ignores the reality reality that God and the Father share a unity in the oneness of the triune God. Now, some others will point to the fact that those words are actually the first verse of Psalm 22, a psalm that expresses what it is like to feel completely abandoned by God. Even to the point the psalmist can say, my enemies pierce my hands and feet and cast lots for my clothing. And yet in the end, the psalmist affirms that regardless of my feelings of aloneness and abandonment, I was never abandoned and God was, is, and shall always be my deliverer. I love the turning point of that psalm. It's verse 24, and I want to read it from the New Living Translation. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but has listened to their cries for help. Obviously, my own tendencies lean towards seeing that connection to Psalm 22. But even if we we just look at that first verse as it comes from our Lord's lips, there's something else there for us. Those questions, and I think we know questions like that. God, why have you forgotten me? God, why have you allowed bad things to happen to me? God, why did it seem like my prayers for someone, someone I love deeply, why did it seem like they went unanswered and, and, and those, that person's just gone now? God, how can you love me when I feel so alone all the time? God, how can you be real? When my life is such a mess and nothing ever seems to get better. And in one verse, we're told that our Lord understands those questions. That he understands our deepest hurts, our most broken moments, and the despair that might threaten to tear us apart or lead us to something unthinkable. Maybe he couldn't be our savior if he didn't understand how hard it can be just to be us. There's an old story A guy goes to a doctor. He says, I'm so down, I can't see up. I have no hope. I'm so unhappy, I can't imagine it ever getting better. I'm at the end of my rope. Doctor, what do I do? 
The doctor says, you know, the great clown Pagliacci is in town. You should just go see him. You can laugh. You can feel joy. You can just let your cares fade away. You need to go see Pagliacci. And the guy looked at him and said, but doctor, I am Pagliacci. And I think sometimes that's us. We can put a great face on things. We can try to always present an upbeat outlook, but we're hurting inside. And if we are honest, we feel a brokenness. So much that it might seem like we're going to drown at any moment. And we just feel alone. And in one sentence, Jesus tells us that he has not only felt our worst pain, experienced our deepest suffering, been at the point that he hung in such a way he couldn't even breathe. He had to pull himself up by the nails to take every breath. In in his hands and feet, he felt that pain. And in the midst of that, his awareness of the Father, his ability to sense his Father's presence was non-existent. The suffering seemed to have just become his entire world, and pain was all he knew. And from that experience, he reaches out to us and says, I I understand. And he says, I understand, not with the casual ignorance of someone who might tell us, I know what you're going through. And, And they say it with good intentions, but we know that honestly, they have no understanding of what we're going through. And he reaches out to us and says, I know what you are going through. You are never abandoned, just as I was never abandoned. And just as I now promise that I love you, and I will never abandon you. And when we cry out to that Jesus, our hosannas, they might start low. They may be quiet. They may even be sobbing. But they can find their place over time with those who can shout them in praise. Knowing, just knowing that the God who understands and embraces us we can praise him like that while even in the praise we're complaint we're com- proclaiming our continual dependence upon his grace you know we carry palm sunday crosses from here today they are a, they are a symbol of our hosanna we cry out in praise we cry out to be saved to be helped. And Jesus answers by coming into our brokenness to the point that he allows it to show him what it feels like to be us at our worst to the point that he experienced it even to the point it took his own life. Hebrews 4 in the message translation reads, we don't have a high priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is so ready to give. Take the mercy, accept the help. Sometimes we don't cry Hosanna, we weep it. And and we find what we are asking for when we weep it to him. We find what we're looking for in his love. He experienced it all but the sin. So he never missed the target of loving God, the Father, and loving others completely. And he still hits that target of love with us when we need him most and when we cry from our lowest places. If there's anything you need to cry out to him today, he's ready to listen, to understand, and to get involved in your life. Because he never abandons us. Even at our moments of deepest hurt and struggle, He is still the one who listens. Can we pray? God, help us to realize that sometimes we feel disconnected. We feel broken. We feel like pain becomes our reality to the point we don't sense that you're there. But your word assures us you are there. You are listening. You care, and you would never turn away from us. You would never abandon us. We may not be able to sense you, but you are there. And Lord, we're assured that you understand because you've been through the deepest possible experience of the brokenness and the separation. God, help us to know that you say, I understand, not falsely, not condescendingly, but as truth of what you've been through. Lord, we cry out to you. 
and we cry Hosanna. It's praise for who you are and how wonderful and good you are to us. But it's also our cry for help when we need it most, when we need you to get involved, when we need you to, need you to come, when you need you to, we need you to open our eyes and ears that somehow we can become aware of you again. God, help us to cry out to you and to believe that you hear and you move and you work. We trust you. We love you. Hosanna, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to end with a couple of verses from Psalm 31, verses 14 through 16, and make it our blessing for this week. The psalmist writes, But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies and persecutors. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. To make that our blessing for this week. May you know fully the confidence that comes from putting your life in God's hands. May you realize that God is at work in your struggles to pull you through. And finally, may you have the light in your life that comes from the assurance that the God who saves you is the God who keeps you always close to his heart. May you have a wonderful and blessed holy week. And may you remember what God has done for us, what our Lord has lived through for us this week, and may you experience his presence in a special way.